picked up some bad habits. And so I would run a cohort of, of the younger managers and the newer managers through a program together and say, this is something for everyone's, everyone's education, everyone's benefits. Uh, you're all going to get something from this, whether you're a brand new manager or whether you've been doing this for a while. Um, I find a lot of managers, even seasoned managers, people who have been doing it for 10, 15 years, often appreciate going back through management development because they get reminded of the good stuff they learned years ago, and then they pick up a few tips and tricks. So I always account for different Yo, what is up? This is Christian D. Evans, host of Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. And I just want to share with you real quick, thank you. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. It really means a lot to us, but also our community. And you know, if you like this, please share this with your friend, your family, a colleague, someone that you don't even like. Definitely share that with them. And then also leave a comment and a review for us. We really do appreciate that. And show our guests some love if you find that this episode really resonates with you. Secondly, also want to share with you some really awesome news. I've had the Fortune Opportunity Network and have incredible guest, eight and nine figure entrepreneurs, CEOs and founders on our podcast. And what we've done is we've actually been able to open up a be uncommon if you can mastermind where we're able to open up the door for so many of you, right? Those that are six figure, seven figure entrepreneurs that are scaling, that are struggling, that really want to level up their game, their business, their life, whatever it is, I'm able to open up that door for you with this Be Uncommon If You Can Mastermind. Now, we're only taking a select few of individuals. So what you'll need to do is go to christiandevans.com forward slash mastermind dash now. And the link is actually in the description as well. Guys, that is christiandevans.com forward slash mastermind dash now. We're only opening this up for a select few of individuals that really want to level up their game. You have a conversation with me. See if you qualify. And guys, enjoy the episode. And remember be uncommon if you can. Cheers. Thank you so much for tuning into Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. I'm your host, Christian D. Evans, and we have a expert technical trainer on today. He has been in the 30 years of experience in learning and development. And today we're going to be talking and specializing development of new managers, focusing on their successful transition to their new role on their team management skills. And the reason why I wanted to have him on is because we're seeing a massive, massive industry move right now. And he's able to help you kind of pivot and obviously roll with the punches with what's going on. And so he's actually the principal consultant at Gerard Training Solutions, my friend, co-founder and CEO, Eric Gerard. How you doing, my man? I'm good. How are you? Very good. Very good. Well, hey, I, I'm very excited about you know having you on because obviously, like I said, there's, there's a lot going on in the industry uh, and definitely individuals that you know get into those new technical positions. And there's a lot of misconceptions that people have. And I'd like to just ask you right off the bat, what are you seeing right now? And then as well as what do you think majority of people struggle with when they pivot to those new positions? Yeah. So what I'm seeing is actually not related or not constrained only to pandemic times. It's sort of universal. And that is we get a high performing individual contributor who is killing it in their role and they're tapped by their managers to take on a management role. Um, Hey, Christian, you are killing it as, as a technical coder, as an engineer. Now we want you to lead a team of engineers. Poof, you're a manager. And this person says, great. Well, I, I know what it took to get where I was to be a great engineer. So I'll just keep doing that but just have people working for me as well. And that's a recipe for disaster. People wind up unequipped. They wind up micromanaging. They wind up being too controlling. They don't set clear goals. They don't know how to coach. They don't know how to provide feedback. This fundamentally, what I call blocking and tackling isn't in place. And so the team flails and underperforms and causes all kinds of problems. So that's sort of a universal umbrella that that I seek to, to remedy for new managers. And then specific to pandemic times is now working in the hybrid environment where you've got some folks who are in the office, some folks who are still staying uh, at home, and how do you manage that dynamic as well? So those are a couple of things I'm seeing at the moment. Well, what's interesting as well is I've noticed like a lot of business owners, there's always that misstep, right? Just like you saying, hey, this is sales guy that's dominating on the floor, right? But for some reason, when you put him in leadership, he just doesn't perform as well. Maybe the, he's just better on the phone or vice versa in the marketing, right? An ads buyer or whatever. Um, and so my question is, is 
as a business owner and, and, and definitely a manager in leadership position, how are you able to proactively discern that before you obviously have a misstep and say, oh crap, that wasn't the best decision because he, you know, he or she is not the best in that in that leadership uh, role. Yeah, so I think it, it comes down to thinking ahead to what you want this person to be successful at doing before you promote them into the role. So rather than promoting somebody who is a great IC and just hoping that they're going to do great in management, sort of seeding, seeding things first and saying, okay, we're about to promote you. So we're going to create a learning path for you and prepare you with the tools and resources you need to get ready to step into that role so that when you do step into the role, you've got an idea of what you're up to. You've got an idea of what you're doing. So that is something that I would see as sort of an ounce of prevention being worth a pound of cure. Uh, because what happens often is I get called in after the fact where people have been promoted first and then their senior leaders realize, whoops, these folks are not making the grade as managers, we need to skill them up. And so then you have to undo bad habits. You have to sort of backfill where if management had been thinking ahead a little bit and thinking, okay, we're about to take this handful of individual contributors and promote them. Let's get them the skills they need first. So that when they step in, it's a smooth transition. So with that being said, um, you know, let's say for example, you do do pivot wrong, right? Because I think we all make those mistakes. We've all had like, you know, uh, we manage a team and all of a sudden you promote someone that, hey, they do really good at that one job, but for some reason in management or leadership, they just don't and they don't perform. What is that kind of um, time frame that you should say, okay, you know what? Maybe we need to pivot backwards, right? Um, is it a two weeks? Is it two months? Do you give them some, you know, coaching a little bit? Well, what does that look like that you have found is like effective, but also you don't wear them out and then they leave because obviously you made a massive misstep. Yeah, you know, I'd, I'd be watching really closely for the first month. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think that there's a magic bullet that says within two weeks, you'll know. Uh, I think you need to watch as a senior manager, as a manager of managers, be watching that new manager, make sure that they're doing okay. Um, and then as soon as you see indications, for example, employee engagement surveys starting to dip or the productivity of that team starting to dip, step in, do some assessment, do some analysis and determine whether you've got maybe a skill or knowledge issue that's happening with a new manager or is it a will issue? Are they just not willing to do what it takes to transition from great IC to great people manager? And if that's the case, maybe you need to reshuffle some things and, and put a different person in that role. Um, there's a great book called The First 90 Days, which helps any new, new person in a role determine what are those key conversations I need to have within the first 90 days of my role. And I would recommend that along with a whole stack of other ones for new managers to determine, okay, within the first three months, within the first quarter, what do I need to do? What are the conversations I need to have with my senior leaders in order to ensure I'm hitting the mark? Awesome, awesome. That's, that's really good insight. I really appreciate that. Now, let's say for example, you, you have that misstep, okay? And like you said, you tend to be in a situation where, hey, you gotta basically create magic, right? That's when they call you in is when the whole house is burning, right? Um, when you work with a client, how do you, first of all, kind of uh, identify the situation pretty quickly? What does that look like exactly? Just walk me through your process and okay, identifying the situation, what actions need to be taken, and then obviously cool everybody down so that it, it creates, like you said, a, 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 an engaging and, and good culture. Yeah. So the first thing I do is, is I start with some analysis. Um, I start with the person who contacted me, which is usually um, – the leader of learning and development, uh, the leader of HR, it may be the manager of the, the team, so the senior manager, but I'll start with that person as my gate, gateway in and start asking questions about what's going on now. So what's the current state? What are the behaviors you're seeing? What are the results you're seeing that you either want to see more of or you want to change? Okay, so what's our current state? Then I start asking questions about what's the desired state. So what do you want to see differently? If things were perfect in a perfect world, how would things be in terms of measurable um, outcomes, behaviors? Uh, what are the metrics you want to see improved? And then what are the gaps? What's in between? And I'll start to ask 
questions rather than presuming. I'll be asking questions about what's in between, what's getting in the way between current state and desired state to, that's blocking your new managers from performing the way you want. And quite often, uh, the contact will know that. They will have seen it. They'll have had some idea. So it doesn't take much to get the ball rolling. So once I had that conversation with the initial contact, then I start digging deeper into the organization. I'll go up the chain. I'll go sideways. I may even go down and talk to some of the employees, some of the people who are being managed by this underperforming manager or this group of underperforming managers to find out, okay, so how are things going from your perspective? And I'll keep doing that until I have a good bead on how things are going in the organization. And then I'll come to my stakeholder with a proposal and say, this is what I think we ought to do. Um, these are the areas I think we need to focus on. And this is how I suggest we put together a curriculum to address it. So when you're solving that, and, and I appreciate you sharing that. So when you're solving that issue, what does, after doing that analysis, right? And then, like you said, the call to action, of the, what, what is the action? What's the plan of attack? What does that look like? So I come at things from a, a training point of view. So my organization is all about training, but that doesn't mean that every problem is a training problem. So I, you know, I love training. I love teaching. That doesn't mean that just because I got a hammer, every problem is a nail. So I'm on the lookout for systemic issues. I'm looking for organizational issues. I'm looking for issues that may not be treated by training. Uh, it may not be a knowledge issue. It may not be a skill or will issue. Um, it may be a functional issue. And so I'll surface those if I, as I bring those up, as I notice them. But then, um, you know, let's say that I've got a good handle on some learning issues, some knowledge and skill issues that can be addressed by training. I'll actually put together a custom curriculum for the for the client and say, these are the areas I think that we need to address in a training program. This is how long how I propose we roll it out. Um, and so we'll we'll create it and organize it in chunks that are digestible by the by the participants. So they're not overwhelmed. Um, especially via Zoom, I would never ask somebody to sit still for eight hours and take an eight-hour training course. I would definitely break that into smaller chunks of, say, 90 minutes and spread that out over a series of weeks with lots of action learning in between. So people learn something, go apply it, come back and talk about it, learn the next thing, and so on. Um, so each, each, in, each intervention is unique. Uh, I don't use a, a cookie cutter. Um, I have a whole bench of content that I can pull from, and I'll create something specific for that client to address their issues. So with that being said, because what I found is very interesting, so maybe you could explain this a little bit. Naturally, someone's going to have to take ownership, right? And what I mean by that is like, okay, it's going to it's, it's going to be someone's fault, right? That that individual or that team or whatever is not performing to the highest level. And that could be obviously the CEO to the president, whatever, who's above them and say, well, you know what? That was my my position. That was my bad. I did not uh, either facilitate that, train them, educate them, or set right expectation, whatever. Or naturally, um, which with larger corporations, it's obviously saying, hey, you know what? Yeah, I guess it's the approach. How would you approach? Is it more just holistic? Hey, everybody in this team needs educated, and we're not going to call out one person. Hey, Betsy, uh, you're, you're underperforming. Uh, I want to have you know, I want to pull you out and have Eric teach you and train you because you're just you, you just suck, right? Um, so I'm just curious, what is that approach um, in regards to like properly handling that, and then making sure that okay, it's it's a grown experience, and it's not a you now let me throw tomatoes at you because you suck. Yeah. So. I would be careful not to cast this as it's someone's fault, um, because what I don't want to do is create a negative negative environment in, in the organization. So I'm not going to I'm not going to come in and accuse the president or the CEO of something, for example, that would just be counterproductive. Um, but once we figured out, you know, the difference between how things are versus how they should be in terms of the way things are being managed, one thing that I find is very very helpful is to run a cohort of new managers or rather new managers through the same program. So you might have somebody, Bob, say, who is a brand new manager who's been at it for a couple of weeks and he's really struggling. And then you've got Betsy, who's been at this for six months um, and is figuring it out, but has taken six months to get where she's at. And she's probably... Um, she's probably good, picked up some bad habits. And so I would run a cohort of, of the younger managers or the newer managers through a program together and say, this is something for everyone's, 
everyone's education, everyone's benefits. Uh, you're all going to get something from this, whether you're a brand new manager or whether you've been doing this for a while. Um, I find a lot of managers, even seasoned managers, people who have been doing it for 10, 15 years, often appreciate going back through management development because they get reminded of the good stuff they learned years ago, and then they pick up a few tips and tricks. So I always account for different levels of experience in my, in my courses so that folks walk away feeling like they all got benefit, even if they've been at it for 10 years or so. I like that approach. Um, and, and I appreciate you, you sharing that because you don't come in already because it creates a negative culture and you always, already want, you already have that. Like people already upset, hey, this person's not, you know, um, you know, performing and obviously, you know, numbers speak for themselves. And so, you know, you, you don't even really have that conversation. It's more of a solution. Here, here it is, what that looks like in building that foundation, uh, which is really awesome. So let me ask you this because everybody loves to be productive, right? Implementing certain systems and processes that obviously eliminate this whole eliminate that pain entirely. Now, of course, naturally we're going to fail, and and you have to accept it. But it's a matter of pivoting very quickly. So my question is like, what could business owners and you know presidents and CEOs do to implement the proper infrastructure on the front end so that they're not in a situation uh, later on? I think it takes some time to think about. Going back to first principles with your organization, what's your company about? What are your values? What's your mission? What's your vision? What are your goals? Do you have all of those things articulated in the first place? So that somebody who is stepping into a management position understands what the company is about and what's expected of them right away. Even if you don't provide management development right away, at least they know where North is and they're headed for a true North. Um, the better organizations realize that they're about to send their high performing individual contributors into, into harm's way by promoting them. And so they at least provide some, some e-learning or some books uh, to get people kind of at least get their mindset shifted from, I'm a great engineer to, okay, now I got to lead a team of engineers. And the best organiza organizations say, we're not going to put you in that position until you've been thoroughly developed and trained. And, and we're going to minimize the gap between the time it takes to train you and the time it takes for you to go apply that. So it's no good if I run you through management development in, say, May and don't promote you until November. That's that's no good because the forgetting curve drops right off. So that takes a little work on the on the side of HR to plan it and to map it out and say, okay, we're going to promote Christian in November. The management development takes uh, three weeks to get through. So we're going to run him through this stuff in October. But before October, there's a couple of books we want him to read. Maybe there's some e-learning we'd like him to look at. Maybe there's an article he can read. So Christian can get started in July and chip away at this list, take the training in October, and then step into the new role in November and be much more successful than if we just thrown them in, in the first place. See, what I appreciate what you're saying is, yes, it's long-term, and that's that's a long process. However, though, it facilitates the best result. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a strategy. It's a very effective strategy. And I just appreciate you diving that in. So now, because you, you say something here, and I want to kind of mention this. So you come in, wonderful. It's hot, uh, heated, the, the house is on fire. You calm it down, okay? Okay, now we're able to build the infrastructure. What do you do, Eric, to help facilitate that culturally so it continues without you having to always be, you know, managing that yourself. Like you can pull back and you can work with another company. How do you, what does that look like to facilitate that um, consistently culturally? Yeah. So one of the things that, that differentiates us is that before we come into an engagement and start doing anything is we immerse ourselves in the country, the company's culture and values. So we get really clear. What's this company about? How do people act in this company? Uh, what, what are the mission? What are the vision? What are the goals? So we understand that first, and then we create our training so that it meshes with that. Uh, we create uh, case studies and examples that mesh with the company's culture. So I'm not coming into 
uh, a high tech engineering company and using banking examples. Um, I just make sure that everything meshes so that all the content that I deliver lands well for, for the participants in the first place. Um, and then I'm also, I do create kind of a drip campaign so that folks can uh, get reminded of what they learned throughout. So I don't just swoop in, deliver training and swoop back out and you never hear from me again. So I make sure that um, there's something left behind. Um, there's a way to contact me if folks have questions. There's coaching that's available. Um, we can do a couple of things to make sure that the learning sticks um, but I don't position myself as someone that you need to lean on. Um, I use much more of a, you know, let's, let's build the knowledge internally so that folks can do a lot of peer coaching. They have the materials, they'll have my decks, they'll have con content to take away so they can reference it. And I encourage folks, hey, you know, work with a learning partner. Even if it's just one other person in the program that you went through, Let's say, Christian, you and I went through a program together um, as a facilitator. I would say, okay, you two guys exchange contact details if you haven't got it already and make sure that um, you check in every couple of weeks and have a cup of coffee and talk about your challenges, your successes, and help each other based on the content that I provided so that you're, levering, you're leveraging yourselves up without having to constantly call me back in. I love it because it becomes self-sustaining, right? And that's what you want to do. You want to allow them to spread their wings and fly without you. And that's your whole goal, right? So they're not reliant on what you have. And again, I, you know, because it, it, what I find so interesting, it is a very strategic thing, right? Because you can come in definitely as a consultant or a strategy strategist. It's like you come in, you solve the problem, but then long-term, stop doing it for whatever reason, right? Because there's not accountability, because there's no system or structure to facilitate that long-term. Uh, now, Eric, I, I want to just kind of pivot kind of like a 180 almost. And the reason I want to pivot is because obviously there's been a lot of stuff that's going on in the United States regarding, you know, shootings within the last two weeks. And you have a really cool assessment, um, inclusive, inclu inclusive behavior inventory. Um, easy, easy to use assessment identifies inclusion gaps, provides practical strategies to work more inclusively. Um, I'm just curious, like, what do you see right now in the industry? Um, just, just holistically in business, and how can we, you know, implement this a little bit more effectively um, to more of top of mind? Yeah. Well, before I answer that, I just, I, you know, I wanted to, to to give a shout out to the folks in Texas. I mean, that's just it was a horrible event, and um, my heart goes out to them. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm heartbroken uh, by what happened. So, um, I think that taking Providing services like the inclusive behaviors inventory allows organizations to say, well, let's do a level set. How are we doing on um, the whole topic of inclusivity in the first place? To answer your questions in terms of what I'm seeing in the industry, I'm seeing a lot of organizations taking good steps to make sure that what they do uh, is inclusive and, and involves everyone in their organization. So I'm seeing that more and more in the in the in the organization. Uh, my background is in Silicon Valley. Inclusivity has been a big push there for a long, long time. Um, I was a part of Apple for a while, and there was an employee resource group for practically every interest you could imagine. Um, so that that's something that's been around for a while, and I'm seeing it, for example, up here in the Seattle area as well, where being inclusive of uh, folks who are neurodiverse. Um, who identify not as just uh, male or female, but but perhaps non-binary is something that's becoming more and more common and accepted. So it's happening in different pockets of the country, but I'm seeing more and more of it. And I think that that's a really good thing um, because that's going to create workplaces that are safer, um, you know, more psychologically safe uh, throughout the country. And I think that that's, that can only be a good thing. Yeah, because I've talked, to a few business owners about this and uh, i'm not going to mention names or anything but a few of them are like hey you know what it's it's like the military a little bit right there are certain things it's like hey our mission is to create revenue right and i'm just giving the military as like okay our goal is to defend this country right and sometimes that gets almost um we get convoluted with other subjects and our our attention is diverted 
from the actual mission, right? Or like obviously C-suite, we're focusing on this. And I think that's a misconception and mis um, misalignment in the way to think because it's like, yes, our goal as a business is to create cash flow and revenue for our investors, for our employees and stuff like that. But also you cannot do that correct me if I'm wrong, unless you have a really solid, amazing team. And again, in order to facilitate a really amazing team, you have to have high quality people and high quality people come from all different backgrounds. But in order to facilitate that culture where it's like, okay, hey, we're included, whether this person is a, a, a male, female, a guy, girl, you know, culturally different, skin color different, right? Believe in different religions, whatever. But as a company, and you said you, you're seeing this overall. A lot of companies are headed that right direction, which is nice. What else could they do to help sure that there is more like that solidification in, uh, you know, culturally in their, in their company? Yeah. You know, you're right in that it takes all kinds of people to create a great team. And I think we're starting to recognize that more and more. Um, so being accepting of all kinds of differences and not just hiring people who look or act like me. I think that that's super, super important. Um, I would say that, you know, before we do anything, before we create a program or start an initiative or anything like that, I think that that, that acceptance and that change has to come from inside of each of us. And we've got to become more accepting and more, what would the word be? Let's just use the word accepting of difference in ourselves first um, before we slap a program out and have HR run some, some kind of an initiative, you know, so it's got to come from the heart first um, before you, you just say, well, you know, diversity is the, the, the flavor in the month. And so we're going to be diverse. Um, I think a lot of it has to come from, okay, well, are you really willing to accept difference in your organization yourself? And you know, do do kind of a hard a hard assessment of yourself first before you implement any kind of a program. Well, because see, what I'm what I found very interesting the last few months, Disney has gotten a lot of hot water in Florida because they obviously came out with a certain political stance. And so what happened was naturally you got one political aisle that was really frustrated and annoyed with them. And then all of a sudden they pivoted. And then all of a sudden you got a lot of other political. So it was like it was a lose lose situation. And I'm seeing a little bit more and more regarding a lot of companies getting a little bit political, which you don't see that often, but you're seeing that a little bit more. Um, and obviously by doing that, you're, you're really, either way, it doesn't matter, but you're really pulling away and pushing away those that obviously, um, and again, it's, it's, to me, I look at it as it's a, it's a distraction from what you're supposed to do. At, you know, when you're at your job, you're supposed to perform, produce and create. And then what happens is it almost becomes a distraction. But obviously we do need to be um, more aware of this. So I, I just would like to get your perspective on that, what, what you saw in, in regards to what they did and did not do right. You're talking about Disney specifically? Yeah, talking about Disney and, and their misstep in regarding like, you know, obviously their, what they what they said and obviously the hot water that they kind of got themselves into. Yeah, you know what? I'm I'm sorry. I honestly don't have an opinion on on the whole Disney fiasco. No worries, no worries. Well, I was just curious what you saw on that because I, I know you're um, you, you see that in today's culture a little bit. So um, let's kind of pivot a little bit. So uh, tell us a little bit about um, your your management fundamentals a little bit because you're able to help a lot of teams really engage at a higher level because of the things that you implement, right? Mm -hmm. So kind of. What are some certain tactics or skills that they have uh, that you have that you're able to help them really build that engagement, uh, that team engagement? You know, one of the things that I really love um, to introduce to teams is uh, Patrick Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team. It's a fantastic book. It's been out for a long time. And if you imagine a pyramid, at the base of that pyramid is trust. So the first thing that these teams have is a strong sense of trust. And there are a few things that you can do uh, initially and then over time to build trust. Um, so just making sure that, that you've got a team that trusts each other, that knows that each individual member of the team is gonna do what they say they will do, that they're, gonna, that they're clear on their job and they're prepared to do it, that they've got each other's backs. That's super important. Um, making sure that the team is equipped to do conflict constructively. 
So conflict is going to come up whenever you got a group of people working together. So making sure that we have the tools we need to do conflict, not shy away from it, but do it in a way that strengthens the relationship and gets better results. Uh, sometimes really excellent results come from conflict if it's done well. So can this team be equipped to do conflict well? Um, and all of this is, you know, these are just samples out of the pyramid, out of the, out of the five dysfunctions. But really what you're looking for is a team um, that absolutely performs, gets stuff done, and does it in a way that respects the other people on the team and, um, and, and demonstrates to each other and uh, stakeholders outside the team, this is a team that's hitting on all cylinders that knows what they're up to. So that's, that's one of the models that I really love to use. Um, another model that I really love is DISC. Um, <clears throat> I'm an authorized partner with, with Wiley's uh, Everything DISC uh, program. And DISC is an acronym for four work styles preferences or four per personality preferences, dominance, influence, steadiness, and conscientiousness. And when you understand your own style and how you tend to approach work situations, when you understand that, and when you understand the styles of everybody else on your team, and then you are given strategies for adjusting and adapting your style in order to meet the other person where they're at and draw them out and get the best out of them, that helps a team perform really, really well. So those are just a couple of examples of, of models that I use that, that tend to really help teams perform very, very well. So when you say constructive criticism, uh, because I do see that you know, it's needed, right? Uh, but there's a proper uh, approach to it. And so what have you found is like the best technique to say, okay, hey, you know what, this isn't the best um, strategy for this or whatever that looks like. So what, what would you find is like the best, you know, approach to that constructive uh, criticism without, you know, losing that synergy um, of that team? Yeah, so there's a, there's a book, Crucial Conversations, um, that I just love. And there's a great way to kind of express yourself when you're getting into a difficult conversation. Uh, once you've done the work in the background to get your mind in the right place before you open your mouth. So, um, you know, you've, you've, you've sort of calmed yourself down and you're prepared to have a, a calm, constructive conversation. How do you open your mouth and start the conversation? So you begin by stating the facts. So, and you use neutral language. So you don't start with you did X. Um, softening it just a little bit, not being wishy-washy, but just softening it a little bit so you don't immediately set the other person on edge. Hey, you know, I noticed, fill in the gap. I observed, fill in the gap. Okay, so I saw these things. And these are facts. These are things where if I had been following you around with my iPhone and filming you, we would all agree that we saw you um, sitting with a red shirt in your backyard. Okay, that's a fact. So I noticed that you were uh, conducting this interview in your backyard and you were wearing a collared shirt uh, with the collar turned up. That's just a fact. And we, we, we would agree to that. It's, it's recorded. The next thing we do is talk about our interpretation of those facts. So I'm beginning to wonder is a great sentence starter here. You know, I'm, it, it's concerning to me because of these things. So then we, we, we get into, you know, what's going on in my head that has me upset or concerned about this in the first place. And it could be anything. Um, the trick is to tell that story as a story. It's not a fact. It's your interpretation. So, you know, let's say you observe somebody uh, leaving the office at 3.30 every afternoon. <clears throat> um, you might begin with, hey, you know, I noticed that, that you tend to leave the office about 3.30 every afternoon. That's just a fact. And we would all agree. Yep, I'd leave the office at 3.30. Well, I'm beginning to wonder if you realize how it looks when you leave before everybody else. Um, it looks like you're not pulling a full, a full day's work. And that, that concerns me because everybody else stays until 5 or 5.30 and you're leaving at 3.30. That bothers me. So there's your story. And then the last piece and the most important piece is to ask the other person's point of view. So that's where you shut up and you listen and you say, hey, how do you see it? What's going on here? What have I missed? What am I not seeing? Please fill me in because I'm genuinely curious and I want to know. 
I want to, I want to come to a good outcome here. And so this is where the other person, if you've done it right, the other person feels safe enough to say, here's my side of the story. Okay. Here's what's going on for me. For example, did you realize that I get into the office at seven 30 every morning? Um, and so I've worked a full day by three 30. Uh, did you realize that I commute 50 miles each way and traffic is murder? And so I'm time shifting to make sure that I work a full day, but don't get stuck in traffic. So this is where the other person can kind of contribute their side of the story. And so when you use this framework of fact, story, and ask, you create a, a situation that is less likely to make the other person defensive, more likely to get them contributing their side of the story. So you have a full set of facts to work with, and then you can have a, 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 a constructive conversation rather than a he said, she said. And what I like about this as well, it is like um, you're innocent until proven guilty. So it's just like, hey, this is what I'm noticing. And could you maybe explain that a little bit further? And uh, I think that's a, that's a really cool approach because it almost sounds like marriage counseling as well. You know? <laughs> so that approach, that's awesome. Um, well, what, I'm, I'm not a so, marriage counselor. I don't play one on TV. Um, I'm, I'm real careful about that. You know, and, and coaching is not counseling either. Um, but you can ask some good questions and get the other person talking to fill in your gaps and understanding so that you've got much more than just half the pie filled out. You've got the whole pie in front of you, and now you can talk about the whole thing. Yeah, a lot of this has to do with like top top down thinking, right? It's very you know mature uh, way of doing it, right? Hey, you know what? Instead of coming in accusation, you know, uh, accusing. Uh, it's more of, hey, you know what, I, I'm, I may not know the whole context. Just like I said, then all of a sudden when I get more data, then I'll be able to say, oh, I see where you're coming from. I didn't know you were coming in at 730. Oh, I didn't know you had a commute. Hey, now now we're coming to the solution instead of sitting there talking like you said, he, sh he said, she said, and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, I love that. I love that. I love that. You know, Eric, I, you've got a lot of resources on your website and you know your community and stuff like that. How can our audience reach out to you, be part of what you got going on, and you know, really implement these things in their own business proactively? Yeah. Uh, easiest thing is to shoot me an email, Eric at GerardTrainingSolutions.com. Uh, you can take a look at the website, GerardTrainingSolutions.com. Um, I've got freebies that I'm happy to share. Um, be glad to, to share those with folks. As a matter of fact, um, as a side note, Christian, I can set up a landing page for folks for your for your audience. Um, they can they can sign up if they want and get a freebie right away that helps them decide whether or not they even need to engage an external training firm. So I can give that to your audience um, if if oh, you'd be, be interested. Yeah, that'd be awesome because we definitely want to put that link in the description. And uh, guys, that was, those links will be in the description below. So make sure you just, you know, reach out to Eric and what he's got going on. Um, and uh, Eric, again, I appreciate just the immense value that you brought. Just talking about like, the infrastructure, the systems, really proactively handling these situations in your, you know, in, in your in your company. Whether you're a, a you know high nine figure business, whether you're a mid mid seven figure business, I think it's very very valuable what Eric's talking about here. It's very strategic, actionable steps uh, that you can implement in your business. Um, Eric, is the, before we let you go though, is there any last words of wisdom that you'd like to share with our audience? You know, one of the things I've been on about lately, if you've looked at my LinkedIn posts, is kindness. I think that there's, uh, there's always room for being kind when you're managing folks. Um, you can have the hard conversations. You can say what needs to be said, but you can do that in a spirit of wanting to help the other person, um, even if ultimately that conversation leads to helping them find a job someplace where they're better suited. Um, but you can be kind and you can be polite and civil while you are also running a big business. Um, and that's just something I'd like to leave your listeners with is that I think kindness trumps a lot of things. I love it. Guys, that is Eric Gerard. Uh, man, I appreciate you being on here. That is Journey with Christian Evans podcast. Until next time, remember, be uncommon if you can. Yo, this is Christian D. Evans, Journey with Christian D. Evans podcast. We thank you so much for listening to this amazing episode. If you feel and you know that this was valuable to you, please show some love to our amazing guest by liking this, by commenting on this, by making sure that you do a nice five-star review and just show some love to our guest. That'd be really awesome. Also, make sure you share this with a friend, a family, a colleague, someone that you believe would 
bring value to their life right now. Uh, and guys, we just want to say thank you again for just being part of our community. If you want to have more resources, don't be afraid. Go to christiandevans.com. You can actually schedule a phone call with me or you can send me an email at christian.evans at beuncommonifyoucan.com. That's christian.evans at beuncommonifyoucan.com. Always love to hear some feedback and let me know what is the number one or two things that you are struggling in your business and your life and we'll make sure we have those conversations. Guys, that is Journey with Christian Davis podcast and until next time, remember be uncommon if you can. Cheers.